Hey, this is Sheldon Primus, and I'm going to move ahead with our navigating through the OSHA.gov website. We are now on the For the Employer section. So this is resources for employers to help them not only be OSHA compliance, compliant, but also to help them with safety and health resources for their employees. Because the number one goal of OSHA is to protect the workers from any safety or health uh, hazards. So this is their way of providing resources for the employers. So we'll start with the first tab. And this is the cooperative programs. So these are some programs that are out there that will help the employers uh, just to make sure that they have extra resources outside of OSHA. So OSHA does have some alliance programs that's there. You can see with the alliance program, uh, there's national alliance, state plans, uh, area emphasis. Here there's products and activities that will help, including certain roundtable discussions, uh, other things that just people were really thinking about to help compliance and safety and health together. So just some minds working together to help develop guidances. Here is program information and you do have uh, some fact sheets and logos and things to help with your your program directives. If you were to click to that you'll see a PDF so then you have to click on the PDF in order to get a copy that you could download yourself but this is the OSHA's Alliance program and it just gives you all the wording and all the changes that revises uh, what you're what is expected with an Alliance program and what resource they have then you have on the back end here success stories uh, from uh, people who have used the Alliance programs. So uh, that is what OSHA is looking for. And so it's just people that are committed to work with OSHA to help the employer just be not only compliant, but to also avoid any safety and health issues. OSHA does have some strategic partnerships, and that is the OSPP program. So their strategic partnerships are with uh, professionals in labor and trade, and their stakeholders in certain of uh, OSHA's missions and passions. So with this, you'll see all the different type of stakeholder activities. Uh, research is available for you here on this part and uh, tells you a little bit more about the partnerships. So this has a, a wealth of resources, specifically with some directives on uh, guidances to help uh, just any of the employer, just to see you know uh, who else is working in your industry, a partner that you may have. And uh, let me give you a, a little view of active, active partnerships. So on a national level, there is a trade association for electric transmission, distribution, and construction. So that trade association is working with OSHA to make sure when they do the revisions to the electrical standard, this would be a subpart R in general industry. When they review that, then uh, OSHA is reaching out to these partners to say, all right, is this rule going to be, uh, how well is this going to be received? Is it protective enough? Is it too restrictive? And uh, that partnership really starts talking things over. So depending on your region, you can actually see what partnerships exist. So I'm going to show you my region, which is four. So there is a partnership with the Associated General Contractors. Emory Hospital has a contractor right now, partnership with OSHA, Georgia Institute of Technology. And there's just a few others here, but you just look into your region and see, all right, who might be the partners working with OSHA to help me as a business owner or even as a safety and health coordinator. Next is your VPP. That is your Voluntary Protection Program. So these people uh, at a certain, um, basically it's employers that are larger size employers, 
OSHA has said, okay, I'll let you guys work in your own regulation. However, you've got to prove it to me that you will do the right thing. So they created this structured voluntary protection program. And within this structured program, if you qualify, qualify for it, OSHA will reduce any enforcement efforts. And on top of that, uh, you will save a lot of money. Uh, there's a few things and you will, you'll get recognition as well. Uh, so there are some program guidances. It could be site-based mobile workforce. Uh, you could have a corporate VPP site. And uh, it's really just you taking care of your safety and health that is going to be beyond anything on OSHA standards. So they give you a full guidance of that, success, success stories. Then there's some resources, case studies. You could use the VPP logo, which you see on the top right corner, top left corner, that will show that your facility is a VPP site, and therefore people will really want to do more business with you. So that's uh, one of the things that they they want to really look at, and that's a, a, a benefit for you if you can become a VPP site. OSHA Challenge, and that's another cooperative program. So with the OSHA Challenge, you now can uh, basically OSHA works with you and you can get their help in developing some of your safety and health standards as well as uh, your programs and some of the things that OSHA looks for in their challenges also has been uh, technology. They've also worked with that. So. Uh, here, I'm going to click on this one here. Employee and management improvement involvement paved the way for Sherm Co. Industries to join OSHA's voluntary protection program. So they are a VPP site, but in order for them to even get to that VPP site, they basically uh, started with that OSHA challenge program. So that program is initiated by management and you get a whole bunch of help from the employees and in that way now you challenge yourself uh, to participate in this three-stage uh, guidance just to get you to the point where now you are so good of a program that you will now be qualified for VPP, qualified for a SHARPS program which we'll go over next. Uh, so this is the guidance that you have here, you've got success stories, and it's kind of like a, a roadmap, if you will, to go from if you have a safety program that lacks in you know uh, ownership, lacks in uh, having a safety culture, this is a challenge to help the whole organization work their way up to top quality uh, safety and health. So they do have some resources with pins and giveaways and flags, and they give you the ideas that you would need to you know, encourage your workers to go into it. So there's some forms you could use. Let's say here's a uh, administration participation forms. Uh, gives you some more of the program information. Uh, outreach tools. And then you could click here for some help. So that's the contact information for that. So I'll go back. The last one, which I mentioned before, is the SHARPS program. So let's say you did have an OSHA intervention before, and they came at you, and uh, the on-site consultation program helped you out, like we talked about in the previous module. So they're here to help. So now that they've, uh, they've reached out to you, they gave you suggestions, you follow up on these suggestions, uh, you can be eligible for a SHARP, which is Safety and Health Achievement Recognition Program. Uh, so I will click on a few of these so you can see. There's a frequently asked questions, uh, who to be eligible for SHARPs. So I just want you to know that you have to be less than 250, well, I should say 251. So if you have 250 or less workers, uh, so that's what makes you qualify. 
So for Business Already in OSHA's on-site consultation program, everyone currently in the program can qualify. And then for new businesses, the size requirements for the SHARP is 250 or fewer and fewer than 500 corporate-wide employees. This upper corporate size limit does not apply for individual franchises. So let's say you do have uh, uh, several establishments so therefore your corporation may have uh, the east, west, south, whatever, and your total number now uh, on the corporate-wide employees, and they're all under you, they're not just you know, individually owned, then now you could be eligible for a little bit more, uh, or eligible for uh, sharps with a higher number count of employees. So with the Sharps program, it's great. It benefits you just the same way that you get the benefit from uh, having the VPP site because now, in theory, what's happening is a few things. You're going to get less injury and illnesses, so that is going to increase your worker uh, while well, they'll feel better about the company and then also the productivity will go up and you're spending less on anything that is related to injury and illnesses so therefore the company now will actually generate more money by not having to pay out some of the expenses for that so that's what all these programs are, are there to do to, to help you uh, so I'm gonna go to the next one so the next one for the employers is the employer responsibility. So here is all the employer responsibility. You'll see this on the OSHA poster. And uh, the mere idea of this is you're responsible for making sure that your workers have a workplace that is free from any known or recognized hazards, suspected hazards as well. And that's also a general duty clause, which is found in the OSHA Act 5A1 in the OSHA Act, Section 5A1. And that is your general duty clause. That's your employer responsibility. And then they give you a few other responsibilities there. Same information you'll find on the OSHA poster. That's what this one is for. So I'll work my way down to free on-site consultation. We talked about this before, but now I could show you a little bit more of it. So this process is free for you as an employer to help you with your system of safety and health. And the consultation visits will give you a full audit, like if it was an OSHA inspection, but you're not going to have to pay any citation. So you could actually get this visit to you free of charge, and you could use this service just to help you see, all right, where am I now? Where can I be in the future? And they'll get you a nice little uh, roadmap to do that. So that's what these uh, consultation services are. To find one, you click on the map here. This map will take you by region or by state, and then i will get you to your consultation website. Uh, right here is Florida, and all this data gets filled in, and then I just go to the website. Uh, so that's what you would do for whatever your area is. So there's a bunch of success stories, consultation resources, cooperative programs, but again, they are here to help you. And uh, right here, this is new data for fiscal year 2015. Responding to the request for small employers looking to create or improve their injury and illness prevention programs, OSHA's on-site consultation program conducted approximately 28,000 visits to small business work sites covering over 1.4 million workers across the nation. So good success story. It's there for you to, to utilize. And I've had several clients use that before, so why not use it, right? Here is help for employers. So it helps you comply with OSHA. OSHA doesn't send you an email, doesn't send you a letter, doesn't notify you by knocking on your doors when rules are changing. That's why you should join the quick takes. And then you can get email notification from OSHA. Opt into that. But other than that, it is up to the employer to know exactly how to comply with OSHA rules and this is where they can find that so you go through all these 
questions and answers and this will really help you with compliance and then they even have a quick start to compliance here for general industry construction or healthcare it's a step by step guidance to tell you how you can comply with OSHA rules so it's a great place to start if you're uh, starting a business or if you have one and you're kinda not sure where you stand right now with OSHA regulations and am I doing stuff right go ahead and go through this guidance it's there just to help you out so I'm gonna click back and uh, I'm gonna go one more down so this is the it's the law poster you can have these sent to you for free and I see this all the time where people start a business and they get hounded by a letter that looks official that's telling them they need to pay X amount of dollars in order to get posters for free Department of Labor has it and uh, your state or county or local uh, workers compensation they have it as well so this is the official sizes. You just have to click on the size. They have it in English. They have it in Spanish. They will ship it to you up to five copies for free. So you could get it right there at your work site. Or if you want to, just copy these. And you could get the uh, the official size on your copy. Or if your copy uh, accommodates those that size uh, paper. But this is the official size. So you could get it in a eight and a half by 14 and most paper uh, most printers do that as well so go ahead it doesn't have to be certain stock uh, type uh, paper you just as long as you print it out in the size you're good so that is the it's the law poster on one side of the poster you know uh, highlighted here it's knowing your rights so this is all the employee side on the other side of the page is the employer's responsibility and I told you it's free however it's a thousand dollar fine if you don't have it so this free poster could cost you a lot all right work my way down protection for temporary workers there's an alliance between the temporary worker um, one of the uh, stakeholders and OSHA just to protect temporary workers. It is a joint responsibility between the host employer and the temporary agency to make sure that those workers, regardless of their uh, their status, as far as uh, uh, if they're natural citizens or not working uh, with papers, whatever that is, the uh, OSHA does believe that you as the host employer have to protect these workers in the same way that the temporary uh, staffing that provided you these workers have to protect them. So it's a shared responsibility. Uh, this is a page dedicated for that uh, temporary worker rights. You'll see a few backgrounds and recommendations from bulletins. Uh, there's some news releases regarding that. They have been some hefty fines to both host and contract employers for violations regarding their temporary workers. So right here are some more resources uh, that is for that. OSHA, they really care about the temporary worker uh, for the U.S. So I would take a good look at that because your temporary workforce can also uh, affect your numbers so if you are uh, uh, throughout the day if you're supervising a temporary worker you're telling them what to do you're telling what PPE to wear you in effect are their employer though they're not uh, staffed by you so therefore their injury and Ill illnesses will be uh, recorded as yours they'll go against your OSHA 300 301 300 a summaries so it's important for you to to remember that those temporary workers can also increase the number of employees that you had just if you are doing the day-to-day -day supervision of those workers and now OSHA says they are yours I moved over to the next tab down and I went to the record keeping form so right here you see uh, these are the logs I just mentioned you have a 
instructions for how to fill out the logs and then you do have a printable format for that and then instructions for each thing these forms are going electronic as of 2016 so excuse me 2017 so your 2016 data will be submitted electronically in 2017 and beyond so if you have not seen the OSHA record keeping course yet I suggest you go to that it'll touch you in details more about filling out the form as well as what the rules are and how to comply with the rules completely I am uh, going down again you have the record keeping requirements so this is giving you that update on the OSHA record keeping uh, so you can see that it's going to be some certain low hazard, uh, excuse me, high hazard uh, industries will have to report. However, if you're a low hazard industry, you are exempt from record keeping. And I've got the list here uh, showing who is those low hazard type jobs that are exempt. So there's a pretty good list. Yeah. But on the flip side, if you are a high hazard job and you have between 20 and 249 workers, you then will be required to submit electronically those records for injury and illness. So that's in here. You got a whole bunch of data here. You've got um, this is the final rule for improving that. This is some of the requirements for record keeping with letter of interpretations and uh, federal register on record keeping and some training modules there but by far uh, this is one of the most important things that you have to know as an employer because the injury and illness records OSHA is going to be really on top of that the next coming coming years this next tab shows you how to report fatalities severe injuries so you can see you can do that by uh, going to your nearest office, you could call 1-800-321-OSHA, which is 6742, or you could report online. So that's another way of doing that. And they do have a fear frequently asked questions section, recording uh, for uh, record keeping and reporting. Gonna work my way down. So we did the record keeping requirement, we did reporting and now small business resources you're gonna see on this page kind of similar to the sharps program the on-site consultation program earlier but I want to point out this small business resource section so if you were to click on that it has a whole bunch of different tools that you could use as a small business or even a large business just to help yourself uh, if you don't have a designated safety department or a designated safety person so some of the things that I do love on this is your e-tools, electronic tools. I'm going to show you one of the electronic tools that I use the most. So I'm going to scroll down and there's a program here called Safety Pays. So I use this to illustrate the true cost of an accident. So the background to this cost estimator, there are three no, excuse me, there's two different types of costs. One is direct, one is indirect cost to an accident. So your direct cost, they uh, have a little a history here, a little, um, just tells you direct cost could be the things that insurance pays for. You know, you're going to write a check for a few things right off the bat. Those are your direct costs, but there are some costs that are hidden after an accident. So uh, this right here illustrates some of those hidden costs. So that is any wage paid to the injured worker for absence not covered under workers' compensation, wages cost related to lost time, and so on and so forth that goes down there. OSHA has a multiplier that they use, and this multiplier was uh, come about by the National Council of Compensation Insurance with OSHA together. This data is from 2009 to 2011. So if the injury costs this amount direct cost you add that multiplier or you multiply the uh, the multiplier to get to the indirect cost you add those together and I'll give you the total cost of the accident then the other half of this is this if you had a profit margin and the profit margin is 3% which OSHA says is uh, basically their default 
So by injury type, let's do uh, let's do a foreign body. Somebody gets something in their eye. At a three percent profit margin, three cents out of the dollar is what you're going to use to pay for this accident. So three cents here out of this dollar in sales, three cents here out of this dollar is what I'm going to use. So this is going to tell me that from those. 2009 to 2011 data, that foreign body one is going to cost total of almost $40,000. And if I only make three cents out of the dollar profit, I'm going to have to increase my sales $1.3 million in order for me to pay for that one, just one, uh, incident. So therefore, you're going to get, you know, workers comp to pay for that or whatever, but now your premium goes up. If there's a citation involved, you're paying for that, and that's all that cost that's brought up in there. So this I use quite a bit. Uh, so I would suggest you kind of fool around with that tool a little just so you could, could see. But again, that is from a small business resources. And then under the small business resources, you got that drop down of all the different type of resources you have under the electronic tools. I worked all my way down to safety pays. But there are several other tools that you have. You got checklists that it's available uh, from OSHA that you could use. You have uh, certain industries have specific things that mean uh, something to them, like evacuation evacuation procedures. You click on this, it has a whole breakdown of emergency action procedures that I could do. And if you have more than 10 workers on your site, when you get your 11th worker, you are required to have a written plan uh, from OSHA, so uh, by OSHA. So this is a good way to help you find uh, your written program. So I'm going to go down. There's Spanish-related resources. So all those resources that you saw before on English, you do have it here in Spanish as well. And so this is a wonderful uh, compliance and assistance for workplaces that do have uh, Spanish workers. And then on the very bottom, it's a contact us. It takes you right back to how to call OSHA, how to email OSHA, how to write OSHA, their search, and the connecting. So that is the tabs for, for employers. You got the cooperative, employer responsibility, you have on site consultation help for employers, the poster, temporary workers, record keeping forms and requirements, small business resources, the Spanish language resources, and how to contact OSHA. So in the next module, we'll go over the laws and regulations and uh, make sure that you guys keep learning more and more about this robust OSHA.gov website. So thank you. See you in the next module.